Hi and welcome back to my physics online video lecture supplement series. In today's video I wanted to talk about statics in solids and fluids and actually today's lecture is the first part which is going to be statics in solids and specifically what we're going to be looking at is the topic of stress and strain. So of course the model for a solid, our typical model, might look like this. Uh, you have a bunch of atoms which are held together by primarily electrical forces. And if you have a crystalline solid, then you can treat each atom as being attached to its nearest neighbors by a series of springs. And so you get some small vibrational motions of each of these atoms thanks to the uh, connection of the to the nearest neighbor but by and large atoms don't get displaced much from wherever their equilibrium position is and for solids there's basically going to be two general types of arrangements you can have a crystalline solid which might look something like this as a model you can also have an amorphous solid which is a more random atomic arrangement this is more like, for example, glass might be amorphous in its arrangement. In any case, what I wanted to talk mostly about was stress and strain. And the these concepts come into play because if you have a force which is applied to some object, that force is going to ultimately be applied over some area across the object. And what that force will do is cause some small deformation to the object. And so that deforming force per unit area in a solid is usually called stress. And so the units of stress are pascals. It comes in newtons per square meter. And in fluids you get a similar type of stress. Uh, in fact pressure is in a sense a type of stress. We'll talk more about that later. Um, basically, the units for both pressure and for other types of stress are newtons per meter squared. Pressure, it turns out, is can be thought of as a type of stress, and it is specifically the kind of stress that causes a deformation of the object's bulk. Um, the deformation itself is measured by what's called strain, and there is... Uh, basically a variety of different types of stress and types of strain that go with those types of stress. So the solids behave elastically. This goes back to the fact that they may be treated as a uh, single atom is connected to each of its nearest neighbors by springs. So springs are the quintessential elastic material. So there's ultimately three types of elastic behavior. There's elasticity in length, there's elasticity in shape, and there's elasticity in volume. And elasticity in length is basically means that your deforming force is longitudinal, like what happens if you have a single simple spring. And basically this longitudinal stress is equivalent to stretching or compressing the object along one axis. So for example, for spring, you can stretch the spring out or you can compress it by either pulling the two ends apart or pushing the two ends together. There's also elasticity in shape. And in this case, the deforming force is called a shear force. It's very much similar to an undercurrent in the ocean. If you have the ocean, you tend to have maybe one current on top which is largely running say in this direction and then a second current which is running in this direction so that if you were to be standing here in this ocean water you'd feel like your feet are sort of being swept out from underneath you by this undercurrent so this would be an example of shearing in a liquid our third type of elasticity is going to be elasticity of volume. And so in that case, the deforming force tends to be normal to the object. So this is, for example, if you have a 
a balloon and you have a different amount of air pressure inside the balloon than outside of it, then the balloon either expands or contracts. For uh, Actually, a simple variation of this is that you can blow air into a balloon so it's inflated, tie the end off so that it's more or less airtight, and then if you take liquid nitrogen or something else that's very, very cold and pour it over the balloon, what you'll see is that the balloon tends to contract on itself because you decrease the internal temperature of the balloon and therefore the internal pressure and so it's no longer sufficient to keep the, the balloon expanded against the air which is surrounding the balloon. Well it turns out that even solids have an elasticity and volume we just don't notice the effect quite as much when we apply a force to them. If you are working in what's called the linear re elastic regime then you can relate stress and strain to each other by a simple equation. So stress, recall, is force per unit area. Strain is a measure of how much deformation is going on. And so you end up with an equation that says stress is equal to some modulus times the strain. So the modulus is, a sense, is in a sense, how tough this object is or how resistant it is to being deformed. So stress, again, is force per unit area. Strain is going to be deformation, which is usually measured as, for example, a change in length per unit initial length, or a change in volume per unit initial volume, etc. So here is a simple plot showing stress versus strain. And this is largely for um, specifically the tensile elastic limits. And, and basically what we have here is imagine you take a spring and you start attaching weights to it. And so what will happen is that spring will begin to stretch out. Well, that is in a sense the force versus the, uh, the uh, displacement from equilibrium. Well, you can replot that as stress because the spring has some particular cross-sectional area so force per unit area versus strain because it stretches and it has some equilibrium length. Even a solid that is not a simple spring, say a metal rod, will behave in this way to some extent. You start attaching weights to the end of the rod, you hold the other end so that the rod is vertical. And so you maybe have some system like this where there's a rod and then you start adding weights to the bottom of the rod, you add maybe a little more weight, you add a little more weight, and what ends up happening is that this rod ends up stretching very little amounts as you add each weight. And so this right here might be the uh, equilibrium length, really from where the uh, top of this rod is down to bottom, this would be like L0, and these right here would be like the delta L's that you're adding, whereas these right here are going to be the stress uh, adding forces. The area, of course, is whatever the cross-sectional area of the rod is. In any case, the first regime is the elastic region, sometimes also called the linear region because you can see that stress versus strain is perfectly linear. And then at some point we start to enter the plastic region. And in the plastic region what happens is you get the, the uh, object to be permanently deformed as you continue to stress it. So in the elastic region, if you were to put a bunch of weights on to a spring, for example, uh, the spring would stretch out. Then if you removed the weights, then the spring would contract back to its original equilibrium position. When you get into the plastic regime, what basically happens is think of it as a spring which has been stretched too far so that some of the coils sort of come undone then what happens is it may return to some previous length, but its new sort of equilibrium length is no longer necessarily going to be 
the original equilibrium length. And that's basically this part of it. And then in the main plastic region from point D to E, you get to the point where if you continue pulling on the object, it's really permanently deformed. It may not return at all to any kind of previous length. There isn't necessarily a new equilibrium or anything like that. And as you continue to add more and more stress to it, you reach the point where it breaks. So that would be like snapping the spring in half. So forces which cause an object to stretch are called tensile forces, and forces which cause the object to compress are, t are compressing forces. These are longitudinal uh, stresses. And again, these forces must be a type of force that's externally supplied. It's like centripetal force, where just because an object is moving in a circle doesn't mean that a new force magically comes into being. It has to actually be some externally supplied force, like gravity or a normal force, or in the case of, of uh, stresses, it's usually somebody pulling on one end or the other end of the rod, etc. And if you get a sufficiently large tensile force, the object stops behaving elastically. That's what that previous graph was showing. And eventually you get to the point where your object breaks. Even if it's like a solid metal rod, if you pull hard enough, the rod will snap. It will break off and now you'll have two pieces of rod that you can't just stick back together. Tensile stress, or for that matter, compressing stress, is the amount of deforming force, which is divided by the cross-sectional area perpendicular to that force. So this diagram is basically showing that. If you were to take a bar, for example, you clamp one end down to your tabletop and then you grab the other end and start pulling on it, what ends up happening is that you've applied some total force to it. And that total force basically is perpendicular to one end of the bar. So the cross-sectional area would be the area of one of these uh, faces, for example, the end face. And so you have some initial length that this bar has, and then the bar actually stretches, maybe not noticeably, but it will stretch a little bit. In this particular picture, the original length is two meters, and with a force of uh, 20 times 10 to the fifth newtons, it is actually stretched by only seven millimeters. That's a very small amount of stretch for a very large force. That's to be expected, of course. And if you apply more and more force, then this amount that this bar will stretch by will get larger and larger. And it turns out that the modulus of elasticity that relates the stress to the strain for a tensile stress is called Young's modulus. So we sometimes use a Y for Young's modulus. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go ahead and, and do a simple use of one of the Cengage animations that they've uh, generously given me access to along with the textbook that I'm using for one of my courses. And what, what you basically do here is you can change two things in this animation. One is the Young's modulus of this material. That's a sort of measurement of how much this material is going to resist stretching. And then the other thing that I can change is how much force is applied. So if I apply less force, then the material stretches less. And if there's zero, then delta L is zero, and the bar has its equilibrium length. If I begin to apply more force, you can see that this force arrow is growing, and you can see that delta L is also growing. And if you look, you can see that the bar is getting larger and larger. And so the, the more force that I apply, the longer that this bar ends up stretching to, to the point where at 600,000 newtons, uh, excuse me, at 6 million newtons, I have a stretch of about two centimeters for a thing that was initially two meters long.
Um, I could go back and change what the Young's modulus is. Let's say that I make it 50 times 10 to the 10 Newton meters squared. Then a very large amount of force still will make it stretch, but not by nearly as much as when it was down at 20. And if I set the Young's modulus down as low as 10, then I may stretch by 4 centimeters at this 6 million Newton level, whereas I was only stretching by 2 centimeters before when this was at 20 times 10 to the 10. So what you can see here is that the larger that Young's modulus is, the more resistant this thing is to strain, which in other words means the more resistant it is to stretching. And then the more force I apply, the more the bar ends up stretching. As I mentioned before, there's actually two types of stress, and therefore there's two types of strain which you can apply to an object longitudinally. Now that simulation that I just showed only shows one of those two. Uh, specifically, it shows tension, which is tensile stress and tensile strain. And that basically corresponds to A in this diagram, in which the object is being pulled apart. So here's the equilibrium length of the object. And if you pull enough, then you might stretch it out so that its new length is up here where this dotted line is. This is actually a type of stress which we have had a little more experience with in class so far. Specifically, we have seen this in the context of a string. So if there's a mass connected to a second mass by a string, then we have actually made use of the tension in the, in the string, which becomes a sort of tensile stress that's placed on the string to pull each mass along. On the other hand, there's also compression, which is the second part of this figure, in which the force is directed inward on the object that's being stressed. And so it decreases its length. It compresses, in other words, or contracts from its equilibrium position to some shorter length, as shown by this dotted line. So Usually what happens is that the same magnitude of force means about the same amount of tension or compression for a small delta L. Um, with that said, there's also an ultimate strength of the material, which basically tells us at what point is the material going to actually break. So tensile strength means the object is stretched until it starts to break. Compressive means it's crushed until it breaks. And the ultimate strength that pertains to each may be different for different materials or may be similar for different materials. So iron, for example, has a much lower tensile strength than it does a compressive strength. Steel has about the same level of both tensile and compressive strength. Brick has more compressive strength than tensile strength. Concrete has the same, uh, actually has an order of magnitude more compressive than tensile. Aluminum has about the same for compressive and tensile. Bone tends to be a little better at handling compression than tension. So this table is giving us a variety of different ultimate strengths. So let's actually now look at an example of that. Uh, you have a certain sky bridge, and it's being supported by suspension cables. So here is a bridge bridge that's being supported by suspension cables. Sky bridge usually means it's running between two buildings. Uh, what you have, though, is when you have a, a suspension cable, basically it means that you have a, like a steel wire of some diameter and some given length, and then you have to, the bridge itself will have some mass and some expected load mass. And so our question is, how many wires do we actually need at minimum
to keep this bridge supported without breaking the wires. And as per that previous table, compressive and tensile strengths for steel are both about 5 times 10 to the 8 newton per meter squared. The way to solve this problem is to note that the ultimate strength of the steel wires is 5 times 10 to the 8 newtons per meter squared. So this means that if the stress exceeds this ultimate strength, of 5 times 10 to the 8 newton per meter squared, then the wires break. So wire will break. So we need to determine how much stress is going to be placed upon this bridge as a result of the fact that the bridge itself has some weight and that the load on the bridge has some weight. So the stress is going to equal the total force divided by the total area. So this right here needs to be less than or equal to 5 times 10 to the 8 newton meters squared. Okay, well the total force we have as a given. It's going to be the weight of the bridge plus the weight of the load. So F bridge is 2 times 10 to the 4 kilograms times 9.80 meters per second squared. So the bridge itself should have a weight of, we'll call it 19.6 times 10 to the 4 kilograms, and then the weight of the load is 1 times 10 to the 4 kilograms times 9.80 meters per second squared, which means that the load itself should be 9.80 times 10 to the 4 uh, newtons. These are both in newtons. Okay, so the total force, F total, is going to be the force of weight of the bridge plus the force of weight for the load and so that's basically going to be 27.4 times 10 to the 4 newtons. Alright, what about the area? Well the area is actually something we can solve for but this area is really going to be equal to the number of wires times the area for one wire. So ultimately the thing that we want to solve for is n. So we could rearrange this equation a little bit, and you can see that n is going to be given by this divided by area of wire divided by sigma. So it's going to be force total over the, call it sigma max. That would be the breaking point. So this right here is sigma max times the area of a wire. And the area of a wire is given here by noting that we have a diameter of 0.5 centimeters. So from an end-on view, the wire looks like this. So this is 0 0.50 centimeters, or 5 millimeters, if you will. And so that's the same as 0 0.005 meters. So the area of a wire is pi r squared, so that's pi times 0 0.005 meters squared. All right, so that means that for the wire, the area is about 7.85 times 10 to the minus 5 uh, meters squared. All right, so now we can plug in our numbers, this for the force, this for the stress, this for the area. And so basically we're going to end up with N is equal to 2.74 times 10 to the 4 newtons divided by this theta max, which is going to be uh, a sigma max, excuse me, which is 5 
times 10 to the 8 Newton per meter squared times the radius of each wire, which is 7.85 times 10 to the minus 5 meters squared. All right, so how many wires will we need? According to my math, and, and making note that this is 27.4 times 10 to the 4 newtons, or 2.74 times 10 to the 5 newtons, what I end up getting is that n, so this is basically n needs to be greater than this number, so this is n needs to be greater than 6.977, and since you can only have a, a whole number of wires, this basically means that n needs to be greater than or equal to 7. So you need at least 7 wires to support this bridge. Presumably you'd therefore have 8 if you didn't want any safety margin, just because usually they come in pairs, 2 to a side, and that's to help balance torque and everything, so that the, the bridge is actually under... Uh, equilibrium condition as well. As a follow-up question to that previous question, what happens if we have three times as many wires as found in the previous problem? That would be three times seven wires, not three times eight wires. Uh, what, what happens as far as the amount that the wires are going to stretch when this load is placed on them? Uh, usually, by the way, uh, an engineer will figure out what the minimum number of wires is to make a bridge or whatever. Then they will maybe round up to the nearest even number and then they usually multiply by some factor. Oftentimes it's 3, oftentimes it's 10. And that's as a safety factor knowing that there can be, for example, a defective wire, there might be some unexpected additional loading, etc. So the question is, suppose we use a safety factor of three, uh, how much are the wires going to stretch under this condition? Well, here we can use basically that stress is going to be Young's modulus times the strain. And the strain is given by the amount that they stretch divided by the initial length. So this would be Young's modulus times delta L over L. So if we wanted to find delta L, then we would basically solve by taking the stress, that's basically force per unit area, and multiplying it by the initial length divided by the Young's modulus. So the force we found in the previous part as 2.74 times 10 to the fifth newtons. The area we also found in the previous part was 7.85 times 10 to the minus 5 meters squared. The length of the wire is given above as 5 meters. That's the, basically the equilibrium length. So 5.0 meters divided by Young's modulus, which is given over here. So this is Y. This is L. So Young's modulus is 2.0 times 10 to the 11 Newton per meter squared. So therefore, our change in length of the wire is 0 0.0872 meters. And actually, if we round that off, it'd be 0 0.087 meters or 8.7 centimeters. So that's actually a fairly substantial amount of stretching. You know, you could actually notice that amount of stretch. Uh, although, again, as a fraction of the total length, that's relatively minor. Um, it's maybe about 2% of the original length of the wire. Okay, our next type of strain and of stress is called shear stress and therefore shear strain. And basically shearing forces involve a pair of forces. 
and the pair of forces, each force is in the opposite direction, each force is parallel to the surfaces of the object which is being sheared. So this diagram right here is basically showing what that looks like. You have a uh, one force acting on the top of the object, one acting on the bottom, and they're pulling in opposite directions. So this is equivalent to, for example, this guy's hand pushing on the book, uh, pushing to the right, and then the friction from the table pushing to the left on the bottom of the book. And so what this basically does is it, it causes the object to tilt or twist or uh, lean or bend, anything like that. Uh, you could think of shearing as being sliding of two surfaces across each other within the same object. And so shear stress and shear strain are related in the linear regime with a very similar equation to what we just used for tensile stress and strain, which is that the stress is equal to the shear modulus times the strain. But now, instead of having the change being along the longitudinal direction so that you have a delta L over L, the actual change is going to be in a direction which is perpendicular to the uh, relevant size parameter. So delta x over h means that this thing tilts such that the top part of it is delta x away from being over the bottom part uh, versus the equilibrium condition whereas h is how far apart are the top and bottom height-wise in a perpendicular direction to this delta x. And as I said, a shear force pair is going to cause an object to twist, bend, tilt, or basically otherwise slide against itself. Uh, if you have an initially rectangular cross-section, the tilt might look like a parallelogram after the shear force is applied. So here's a diagram that shows that. With no shear force applied, this object would basically look like whatever the dotted line is. So it's a perfect box shape. And then when the shear forces are applied, the object basically tilts. And so you can see that this top corner has been displaced delta x from its equilibrium. This has been displaced delta x in the same direction from its equilibrium. You now have a tilted object, which looks more like a parallelogram if you were to view it from this side. So the parallelogram is here in the solid figure from the side. And again, that's similar to what happens if you were to push on the top of a book, which is sitting on a table, and sort of the bottom part of the book wants to stay in place, but the top part maybe starts to move. Um, the extent of the deformation ultimately is going to depend on the height of the object, which is the distance perpendicular to the shearing forces. Uh, distance is between where the lower shearing and upper shearing forces might be applied. So this right here is the height, and this right here is the height of the smaller one. And the larger that is the object, the larger will be delta x for the same amount of shearing forces and the same shear modulus. So this one, the angle, if you were to measure the angle of the parallelogram here versus here, you get the same angle, but because this one is taller, therefore your total displacement is also larger. You can, of course, also break an object via applying too much shear forces. With tensile stress and strain, what happens is the object tends to snap apart. In shear forces, you usually end up ripping or tearing an object. You can also snap the object if it's a solid, but if it's a piece of paper, for example, then too much shear force causes the paper to tear. So basically, breaks might look like this. It means basically that two consecutive 
layers within the solid now slide across from each other. So one example of breaking an object via shear forces actually would be punching a hole through a wall. So if you punch a hole through a wall, you break the wall. But you break the wall because layers of the wall end up sliding across each other. So elsewhere I have already worked through an example of what uh, shear breaking might look like. Basically, if I was going to try to draw it, here's sort of an end-on view of the object that's going to be broken. And the fist comes down and punches the object. And so there's some amount of force that's being applied onto the object from contact with this fist. And so basically what this does is that a little segment of the object ends up basically sliding downward across the object so that you end up with an object like this that then has a hole drilled through it from the fist. And so out comes the solid of whatever you've punched through. And if you were to look at this from the top with this piece removed, you might see something like this, where there's now a hole where the fist has hit the object. So this is the hole that has been broken out. And so this face right here, this entire lateral face, is basically sliding across the equivalent face inside the hole. And so when breaking, you ultimately need to know an area, but the area you need to know is something like the lateral area of this face. So if, it, if, this, if it is a hole like this, then the object that has been punched out of that hole is basically a cylinder. And what you would need is the lateral area, which is going to be given by pi times 2r, or pi times d, pi times the diameter, times the height, where this right here is r, and this distance right here is the height. So the thicker that the object is, the more difficult it is to end up breaking it but also the larger is the area of the thing that you're hitting the object with, the more force you need in order to make a break in the, the object in question. This brings me to the third and final modulus and the third and final type of stress and strain, which is uh, that objects have, a solid object has a volume elasticity, and that's the tendency of an object to retain its shape and size against squeezing. This property, by the way, is true not just for solids. A liquid also will have a bulk modulus, even though liquids tend not to have any kind of Young's modulus or shear modulus, because in a liquid, consecutive layers will slide against each other just fine. The only thing preventing that is basically friction between layers. And maybe we'll get into that in fluid dynamics. Um, in any case, if you have a solid object, then it's going to have a tendency to resist compression, which is measured by the bulk modulus. So the larger the bulk modulus is, the less compressible the object is. And even the most rigid object is going to be ultimately somewhat compressible. And what the compression is caused by is a a larger force inward than is supplied outward from whatever material is inside the object. And the more you compress the object, it turns out usually the larger will be the force outward from whatever is inside the object material-wise. So the force in question is actually going to be force applied over each area of the face of the object. You'll notice that there's actually six 
faces and six force arrows to this diagram. So this force arrow is perpendicular to this side face. This one is perpendicular to the bottom face. This one's perpendicular to the face in front. This one's perpendicular to the right side. This one's perpendicular to the top. This one's perpendicular to the back. So the, these forces are all pushing inwards against this object and sort of squeezing it. And the type of stress that we deal with with bulk uh, modulus is what's called pressure and pressure is force per unit area. So if it is a solid object the pressure typically is because the object is surrounded by a fluid outside of the object although you could in principle place this object in a sort of vise which tries to compress multiple faces together simultaneously. And if you have an object which is a fluid, then there may be an internal pressure and an external pressure. And so the thing that matters ultimately is the pressure difference. Is there a larger force outward pushing in or a larger force inward pushing out? Well, it depends on the exterior pressure and the interior pressure. So it's actually a pressure difference that affects the bulk properties of a material. So volume stress is coming from differences in pressure from outside versus inside the object. And one way of thinking of that is, again, this three-dimensional object is really consists of many layers of atoms. And if you were to push on the outer surface of this uh, object in all directions towards the inside, then maybe the outermost layer compresses a little bit inward. And that pushes on the next layer to the inside. And by Newton's third law, that layer has to push outward. And so on all the way down to the core. So each layer is pushing inward on the next consecutive layer. And that next consecutive layer is pushing back outward on its next consecutive layer to the outside. And so what happens is if the pressure outside the object is greater than this internal pressure, then the object will tend to decrease in its volume until the, the pressure buildup is sufficient inside to balance that of the outside. And so if we were to look at stress versus strain for one of for the bulk objects, then the equation looks like this in the linear regime. And so instead of force over area, it's delta force per unit area, or in other words, delta P, the change in pressure from outside to inside. And that is going to be equal to the change in volume per unit initial volume, or unit equilibrium volume, times the bulk modulus. The bulk modulus is what measures how much strain per unit stress you're going to get in the linear regime. So I wanted to look again at another simple simulation that is put together by the folks at Cengage. And um, basically this is to look at bulk modulus and then look at the amount of force versus the uh, change in volume for this object. So again, if you don't apply any force to the object, then regardless of what the bulk modulus is, there's no compression of the object. The volume is in fact the initial volume, and so delta V is zero. And if you start increasing the amount of force that you apply, you basically end up compressing the object more and more so that its volume is getting smaller and smaller, uh, up to the point where for this particular object, which has a relatively low bulk modulus, and under a very high force, you get about a uh, you know, 2 times 10 to the ne negative 4 cubic meter change for something that was originally 10 times 10, or 1 times 10 to the minus 3 cubic meters. So this is like a 10% reduction in volume for this object by the time all is said and done. Um, of course, this is also a very large force. This is 40 million newtons being applied to the object. Uh, and then again, if you reduce the amount of force, you also reduce the amount by which the volume is decreased.
and at the other extreme something with a very high bulk modulus will tend to have a very small amount of change in its volume um, per unit force that's been applied so actually you can look and see that this is a factor of almost you know, here's a factor of 10 difference in bulk modulus and the corresponding factor of 10 difference in how much the volume has changed by. So this thing's only been reduced by about 1% or 2% of its total volume. So what I have here is a few typical values of a variety of different moduli. You know, the Young's modulus, the Shear's modulus, and the bulk modulus. And the units here are giganewtons per meter squared. So all of these numbers are basically times 10 to the 9 newton per meter squared. So we can compare which ones are tougher to compress versus which ones are tougher to just simply stretch versus which ones are tougher to shear. And the general tendency is that an object which is larger Young's modulus will also tend to have a larger bulk modulus. Uh, it's not always exactly a one-to-one -one correlation. For example, aluminum and brass have about the same bulk modulus, but brass has a you know, more than 20% greater Young's modulus. And similarly, glass has the same Young's modulus as aluminum, but a very low bulk modulus. Uh, however, by and large, it tends to be that a larger Young's mod modulus also means a larger bulk modulus because a object which is compressible in three dimensions is very often one which is compressible in a single dimension and vice versa. Um, if you look here, you can see that of the materials listed, the one that is basically toughest to stretch or compress and also toughest to shear is tungsten. Uh, steel is also a very tough material and then at the other end there's stuff like lead which is a soft metal which tends to be very easy comparatively speaking to both stretch and shear and compress and bone actually also is a relatively weak material compared to many of these others. So I wanted to look at another example. This one is about the compression of a fish as it dives into the ocean. So here's our fish and basically you're going to be given a bulk modulus for this fish and we know that the fish normally swims near the surface of the ocean and this one for whatever reason decides to venture down very deep, maybe three kilometers below the surface. So assuming for some reason that the fish doesn't make any internal changes, by the way that's, you know, fish do make an internal change. Uh, they use a swim bladder to dive or to float. So this is not a perfect example of how a fish actually would operate, but maybe if the fish is actively swimming down as opposed to passively swimming down by using its uh, swim bladder. The question is how much uh, stress and strain are we going to be putting on this fish? Um, we'll, we'll take the fish's volume to be maybe a liter, so that's 10 to the minus 3 cubic meters, and given that we want to know what's the total stress and what's the total strain on the fish at the new depth. All right, well, recall that the stress in this case is actually going to be a change in pressure. And we're given what the pressure is at the surface and what the pressure is uh, three kilometers down. So this actually is going to be the difference between this pressure and this pressure. So that's 3.03 .03 times 10 to the 7 minus 1.01 .01 times 10 to the 5 Newton uh, per meter squared or Pascal if you will and so the total stress on this fish is going to be about 3.02 times 10 to the 7 Pascals. Alright what about the strain? Uh, 
Well, stress is going to be the bulk modulus times the change in volume per initial volume, per unit initial volume, that is. And so what we want to know is how much uh, is this fish going to see its volume change per unit volume. We're basically solving for this term right here. This is, in fact, the stress term. So this right here is saying that stress is equal to strain divided by the bulk modulus. And so that's going to be 3.02 times 10 to the 7 pascals divided by uh, the bulk modulus is given up here, 2.1 times 10 to the 9 pascals. So 2.1 times 10 to the 9 pascals. And that gives us a total strain of approximately 1.44 uh, times 10 to the minus 2, or rounding off to two significant figures, 1.4 times 10 to the minus 2. So that right there is the value of the strain. We could take it a step farther given this initial volume of 1.0 liters. Uh, this right here is change in volume per unit initial volume. So if we wanted to figure out what the change in volume is, then it's going to be that number times the initial volume. And so it would be 1.4 times 10 to the minus 2 liters. Or if you would rather, this is a change in volume of 14 milliliters. So the fish is actually compressed by about 1.4% of its initial volume. Okay, well that's all that I have for the elastic properties of solids. Uh, you could think of this as the um, a continuation of the statics and equilibrium discussion from previously. Uh, the next thing that I will talk about in part two of this lecture is actually statics in fluids. Um, so. I hope you enjoyed this video and thanks for watching.